There's less than a month to go before Britain's scheduled departure from the EU and the Union is staking out its final positions on the terms of withdrawal. My guest this week here in Brussels is the Belgian MEP Philippe Lamberts, who sits on the European Parliament's Brexit Steering Committee. Has the EU negotiated in good faith and is that famous unity of the 27 beginning to crack? Philippe Lamberts, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. Let's talk first about Brexit, if we may, and the possibility that Britain might seek an extension of the Article 50 process. You said the other day an extension must be accompanied by a credible plan for holding a people's vote on the final deal that includes an option to remain in the EU. Well, that's my preference, but there's mo there must be a credible plan. But since when is it your job to tell the British people that they should have another vote on the referendum I'm and not what they should them. vote on? I'm not telling them. I know that my you said people they must. They must. My my people in Britain tell me that's what they want. My allies in Britain, uh, the Greens, the SNP, and the Welsh uh, uh, Party, do want uh, these people's vote. Some, so some I people support do. them. Some people do. I, I know, but, but my then, people in Britain want this. So but I support you, but them. You, but you come out and say this, and you're interfering in the uh, democratic processes of a Absolutely. sovereign state. Absolutely. I'm just speaking out my mind. I'm not instructing the Brits what to do. What I'm saying is that if they want an extension, they need to say for what. And it can be a people's vote, it can be a, a new election, it, it must be, we need some time to adapt to all Why should they say laws. for what? Angela Merkel says that they should have their extension, we're not going to say no to it, she says. There should be an orderly Brexit. I agree with that. For, the, for, for Britain. But not at any cost. Not at any cost, because uh, if... Why not? It's in everybody's interest, isn't it? You don't, not, want, to not, see, you don't want to see an orderly Brexit? Not just... Not just any orderly Brexit. Just imagine that we, we do it the way the ERG wants us to do it. Basically, what they want us is to open a 550 kilometers back door into the single market, uncontrolled, unpoliced, and let any... That's simply not true. That is that, true. That is that simply is not true. true. They have true. offered all kinds of means of checking what goes through what this border. What kinds of means? You must be kidding. Including I mean, a common rule book whereby they would agree by treaty to harmonize the, the standards ERG? with... With the ERG, you must the, be the kidding. Uh, you're talking about the European Research Group. Exactly. I'm talking to, to about the government. I'm talking about the government. I mean, the British government. I mean, you go around saying that Britain wants you to stop policing your borders. Absolutely. No, no, they've offered you. They've offered you a number of different ways. They've of offered checking what goes absolutely through the border. Absolutely not. And this is why. Of course they have. What was the common rule book that, I mean, that it's Theresa because, May suggested? I'm sorry to say it's not because you say something that it is true. It's not because you say that they've offered controls that it is true. They've just said, maybe technology will save us. You know what? I so worked what did 22 Mr. years. Barnier I turned worked, down then. I what did he turn down? He turned down the technological um, exactly, suggestions. Exactly, because, so, they, this because is, the suggestions this is were made. You, because you this can, is fantasy. You can say they're fantasy. You can not like them. But don't say that no. they weren't offered. They were offered. I mean, if I offer you a double sun in the sky, I can say that. It doesn't make it happen. Mr. Lamberts, this is the key sticking point, the Irish border, the border between the yes. Irish Republic and Northern Ireland. If Britain crashes out without a deal, day one on this border, what happens? There will be controls. Who's obviously. putting up those controls? Well, both sides will need to, to put uh, well, them up. Well, Britain says it isn't and Ireland says it isn't. Of course. Of and course. Ireland says it isn't. Well, we will need to have contingency plans for that, of course. So what from are your one, contingency from plans? Day one, from day one, of course, you don't expect that smugglers will start importing goods into Europe because at the moment we have alignment. But very soon, if this border is not policed, well, it will be abused. And what I don't are the EU's plans then? Well, do you believe that we are going to put these plans in the open? Two, two, 208 border crossings. Yes, and You more. propose to police all those, do you? Well, we will need to control. We will need to control. Against the wishes of the Irish state, against the wishes of the Irish well, Republic. They've me, made it perfectly clear. What we're saying is very clear. This is from Simon Coveney, yeah. the foreign minister. The Irish government will not support the re-emergence of border infrastructure on this island. Can it be clearer than that? No, it cannot be clearer than that. But then they know the consequences. That then we will put the checks elsewhere than on the intra-Irish border. Who, who, will, who will put the checks? Well, the European Union member states. What do you believe? Well, what, what, what do these checks look like then? Who, who, who's going to put them up? Frontex? Well, 
but not Frontex. I mean, the, the customs, uh, uh, the, 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 the customs authority in the various member states. I mean, what do you believe? Uh, do, do, do you believe that we are going to let any good enter the European Union, just unchecked? And so, if if the Irish don't do it, then of course people on the continent will. will so there will be it. a border between Ireland and other and, EU and, states. And I tell you that the. Republic of Ireland is very much preoccupied about the integrity of the single market and doesn't want to be excluded from the single market. And believe me, and this is the calculus that many British uh, are, are, are just ignoring, is that yes, a hard Brexit will be damaging for the EU27. It will be even more for the UK, but that is not our problem. It will be damaging for the 27. But, uh, uh, well, di a disintegration... Lose, 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 as Absolutely. Simon Coveney said. Lose, Absolutely. lose, lose. Absolutely. But then again, disintegrating the single market just to please the ERG will be even more damaging. And between two evils, we have to choose a lesser one. So it's a choice between the Good Friday Agreement and the single market then, isn't it? Well, it is In a choice In February, you warned Dublin that if it came to a choice between those two things you would decide that the single market was more important? Well, we will decide for what plan. we are responsible. You made that plan. I mean, the British, the British politicians remind us too often... I'm not that talking about the British politicians, I'm talking about what you... I'm talking to you. You, you I mean, are talking You decide about. whether you want to listen or not. I mean, I don't care. I mean, that, that's your point. You want an answer, I give it to you. I mean, the Brits are responsible for the Good Friday Agreement. We are not. I mean, the two parties to the Good Friday Agreement are the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. And I mean, it is a responsibility of the United Kingdom to stand by its word. And what the ERG is not doing and what the extremists, the extreme Brexiteers are doing is basically reneging the Good Friday Agreement. You, go around you saying cannot, it, you cannot you want hold to the European the Union. You want well, to protect the Good Friday Agreement. As far as we Friday can. Agreement. But we cannot defend it if one of the two parties to the Good Friday Agreement doesn't. But right? you give Ireland a choice don't you? Good Friday agreement? I'm giving the Brits... Or the single market? The Brits have to make up their minds whether they want to stand by an agreement, an international agreement that they signed. It is their responsibility. You told an audience in Dublin that if the Irish government said to hell with the single market, let's keep the Good Friday agreement at any cost, well, there'll be 26 other member states who won't see it that way. Exactly. So you're opening up a huge rift between Ireland and no. the rest of the no, EU. No, it's for, it's for, again, the two parties to the Good Friday agreement to decide what they want to do. But the prime responsibility lies with the British government and the British parliament because they are the ones who have sapped the very basis of the, the foundation on which a Good Friday Agreement is built, that is the common membership of both the Republic and the United Kingdom to the European Union. It is what made possible the Good Friday Agreement. If the Brits remove their part of the foundation, they have to replace it with something so else. So you, you we basically offered... went to threaten Ireland, didn't no, you? Your message no. to Dublin was well, crystal clear. That, the EU's interests are more important than yours. No, we are not just saying, we are just saying that we have a responsibility for the single market. Ireland and the United Kingdom have a responsibility for the Good Friday Agreement. We'll do everything we can within the, re, the, the space of reason to support the Good Friday Agreement. But, but if one of the two parties to the Good Friday Agreement breaks it, what can we do? What can we do? And just to ram home your message to the Irish, you gave the example of the Greek crisis, where you said the EU did, did ev whatever it took to keep the integrity of, of its the monetary, monetary union, union Absolutely. and would do whatever it took. Interesting that you mentioned the example of Greece, because it's one of the great examples of how the EU was willing to trash the economy of a member country and humiliate its people simply to keep its precious rules intact. It's and you were basically offering the same to Ireland, weren't you? No. No, Whatever just, the cost to you, we'll I do mean, it. We'll the, keep the single market integrity. And I think, and I have reasons to think, that the Irish government also wants to keep the integrity of the single market, believe me. And look what, look what your measures did to Greece. One in three my now. Measures, my the measures. The EU's measures. I don't know who you are, but I, I was not the part measures. of the Eurogroup. I was not part. Well, we fought against these measures. One in three living below the poverty line. Some 500 more suicides registered among males between 2009 and 2010. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? This, mean, this is how you impose your rules on the countries in the who EU. Who are you talking at? The EU. The EU no, Commission. I'm not the EU. The Troika. I'm not That the took over the economy. Am I the Troika? Am I the European Union? No. But you went to say to Ireland that they would use the same priorities to keep the single market I take intact. From, I take my cue from history and when the European Council wants to keep the integrity of the monetary union or single market, their determination is complete. I'm not a head of state and, and government, I'm a member of the European Parliament. I will never accept to be taken 
uh, well, made accountable for policies decided by politicians which, uh, with whose political orientation I don't share. As you know, if you follow Greek policies, that we fought against the memoranda that were imposed on, on, on Greece all along. Because we know that the Greek rescue plans were actually rescue plans for Deutsche Bank, for BNP Paribas, for Credit Agricole and, and Co. You know that. So if you want to make me appear as if I were Mr. Troika, Mr. European Council, well, this is, this is a game, right? So, uh, no, I, I'm not a player in that game. Sorry. So you're against uh, maintaining the integrity of the single market at any cost, are you? What are you playing at? Are you? I'm asking you a question. I'm saying no. I want to keep the integrity of the single market. I don't want... Whatever the cost to the member state. Whatever not whatever the cost. the cost to the member state, but the, actually... What you are asking, if, if I may, is basically that we, we give way to the most extreme Brexiteers in the UK who want their cake and eat it. Why should we do no, this? One, if, if you end up with no deal on Brexit, because neither side has blinked, your rules, the EU's rules, will have served no useful purpose, will they? They, would have, they would have taken everybody to a place they don't want to get to. No, I to that lose-lose-lose situation, no, I, th I, they? I think that the they? taken you to that. I think that the hard Brexiteers want to go there and find by me. I mean, uh, they do whatever they like. If they have a majority in Parliament to do that, who am I to oppose this? But I, I do believe that the vast majority of British citizens don't want that to happen. Let them manifest themselves through their representatives in the House of Commons. If rules don't produce winners, what's the point of having them? Well, don't you believe that the single market produces winners? I mean, we are better off with a single market in a globalized economy than but without the, it, believe me. But in this me. instance, if everybody will lose from... We would lose... ...from the outcome, if Britain crashes out and there's no deal, if everybody's going to lose from that, what use are the rules? Do you then go and say to Europe, ah, we kept our rules intact, but never mind. I mean, they've lost out badly and we're losing out badly. Everybody loses. Let me, let me just remind you one thing is that if we destroy the single market just to please the hard Brexiteers, the damage will be an order of magnitude bigger. So yes, it's an evil, yes, it's a lose-lose situation, but giving the extremists their way would be massively more damaging. And yes, we would have a, a prefer to avoid Brexit, but if it comes to that, well, we will choose the form of Brexit that is the least damaging, but damage there will be. You'll cut off your nose to spite your face. You'll do something that even damages you as well. Well, we are protecting our interests as best as we can. Those who caused the damage in the first place are those who chose to interpret the results of the referendum in the most extreme way. There was not one way to interpret the result of the referendum. A form of Brexit had to be negotiated quite obviously. There was a mandate for 52 48 to do that. But nothing, nothing. Democracy forced. is messy. Democracy is messy, you say it, exactly. When the Prime Minister said, we are going to be out of the single market and customs union and jurisdiction of the ECG and everything. We are going to uh, respect the Good Friday Agreement and we are going to have no divergence between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. You know what? She was just saying something that was impossible. I mean, these three things are mutually exclusive. I mean, it's not because you say and you keep repeating them that you make them possible. I mean, when they are mutually exclusive, they are. And, and actually, the, the predicament of Theresa May is one of her own making. She decided to go that way. She could have chosen a different interpretation of Brexit. And actually, what the hard Brexit is fail to recognize is that many promises they made during the campaign were made were actually made impossible by the existence of the Good Friday Agreement. I, I want to move on because I want to talk about prioritizing rules ahead of results. No, 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 no. It's prioritizing results ahead of rules. Look at, look mean, at the security arrangements, for instance, the new security arrangements between yes. the EU and the UK and the haste in which the EU is going to cut Britain out of databases, Schengen database yes. and uh, Europol database. How does that serve the security interests of Europe, prioritizing rule, th those rules and procedures over safety and security? Because the EU will be less secure without Britain. As, and part Britain, of, as part of that system. And Britain will be less secure it as well. It may well be, but are you prepared to have that? You could prioritise the fact, say, how are we going to get the best deal with yeah, Britain? Yeah, but then again, I'm sorry to Instead say... Instead of just cutting them out of the databases. I don't know what game you are playing, but the, the point is that you fail to recognise that the European Union has a value in itself, the single market has a value in itself in terms of providing leverage, right? 
And basically what you say is that for short-term expediency, we should sacrifice the leverage. The safety of Europeans is short-term expedience? Absolutely, because you really? can achieve really? the same goal. You can achieve the same goal while keeping the integrity of the European Union. The United Kingdom can have security agreements with the Uni European Union, but these need to be negotiated. If the United Kingdom wants to become a third state, fine, but that it will be treated as a third state and we will have bilateral negotiations and we'll see what comes out Mr. of them. Mr. Lambert, where Europol is concerned, about 40% yes. of everything that Europol does is linked to work that is either provided or requested by the UK. In 2017, that is one area where the UK invested in a EU institution. Yeah, in 2017, the UK contributed over 6,000 pieces Good. of information to Europol, Good. more than any other country. Yeah. And you will lose that by Not necessarily. cutting, by we cutting will negotiate. Britain out. We will negotiate. We will negotiate. But do you think that negotiation starts by accepting what your opposite number wants? No, that's not how it works. I've negotiated long enough in my life to know that the negotiation starts when the customer says no. Right? What, and it ends when the customer says yes. What your negotiators seem to obsess about is that Britain must appear to lose no, from this. No, absolutely not. Absolutely the EU not. has made it clear that leave, leaving the EU is a mistake but, and that should become a self-fulfilling prophecy no, now. No, Britain uh, has to lose. No, Whoever else loses, Britain has to lose. I mean, you play the ERG part, but, but th that again is a lunacy. I mean, uh, no, we just say that membership of the European Union has benefits. And of course, if you're not a member, you don't enjoy those benefits. It's not punishment, it's just statement no, but of you fact. Could, my point is that you could have enjoyed those benefits. You could have prioritized results over process. But you don't do that. You say that. You say that. You're the one who said that in, I think it's 2017. No, I preserve the integrity of the European Union and its single market in the negotiation with Britain. Because and in 2017 you complained that the EU was a bureaucratic leviathan. And now you seem to be a cheerleader. And now I'm you seem to be a cheerleader. cheerleader for it. I mean, democracy is messy, as you said. I mean, do this you is believe bureaucracy that, we're talking about. Yeah, but we are talking about the, the democracy. Rules. We are talking about the institutions of, a, of the first attempt in the world of having a transnational democracy. Do you believe that is, it happens without difficulties? No, of course not. That's and without reality. rules? With, certainly not without rules. But you're rules. pretty selective. The EU is pretty selective about which rules it uh, enforces ah, yeah? and which it doesn't. Give me an example. Okay, let's take the stability pact. Yes. All right? The fact is that since it was introduced, not a single year has gone by without at least one member country's finances right. breaching EU guidelines. Remember yeah. the Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker's yeah. infamous claim in 2016? Yeah, France yeah. was given yeah, leeway yeah. on because fiscal France rules is because France. it is France. <laughs> exactly. And you ask me You're for right. examples. You're you right. know perfectly well there yeah. are examples. And I share this. your criticism about that because indeed it seems to be a, a sort of a two-speed uh, judgment on uh, public finances. If you're a big country, you will be treated differently than a small country. And there's evidence to that. And Same I, in 2016 when Spain and Portugal breached the rules. Brussels decided to set fines at what level? Zero euros. Exactly. What message did that send? That these rules are not really credible. Yeah, I agree exactly. with you. I agree with so you. So you get rid of your rules when you feel like it and you enforce them when, yeah, you, but then when, again, when it suits you. Really. I mean, it's really interesting because uh, you, you treat me as if I were the European Union. You know, European Union is diverse. There's diversity in our democracy. There's people who agree with certain uh, policies and those who disagree with them. And I happen to agree with some and to disagree no, with but others. You trumpet That's the democracy. System. You, you are in favor of the I mean, rule based system to protect yeah, but your single all, currency I'm also, and your single market. Yes, but I'm also on record saying that the budgetary rules of the European Union are unfit for purpose. That's reality. They have no scientific ground at all. We wrote the 3% rule, so the fact that public budgets cannot go over 3% deficit and public debt cannot go over 60% of GDP. And you know what? These figures have exactly zero scientific substance. They are purely arbitrary. And so indeed you cannot do good policies without, well, just based on arbitrary figures. So if these rules are unfit for purpose, I am not that worried that, uh, well, we play with them because, well, they are unfit you, for you purpose. You do, you play with but, them, yeah. Let's talk, if we may, about human rights, because this is a subject that you, you care do. about. You wrote a couple of years ago that the most powerful breath of hope for all those who were living under the oppression of authoritarian regimes was the European Union. 
Well, I, not anymore, is it? Yeah, you're right. I mean, when not I see anymore. how we how we go in bed with uh, the likes of uh, Mohammed Al Sisi or, or Putin or, or well, or, Mohammed Al Sisi. Let's take that example. Yeah, a couple yeah. of days ago, you happy that the EU Absolutely was giving not. legitimacy? Absolutely that? not. Absolutely not. So and why of course, you, you you rail about it, but nothing's ever done, is it? Well, we you continue with uh, let association agreements with Egypt. You well, don't hit them you, where it you, hurts, again, do you? Again, I mean... You don't hit them where it You hurts. can continue playing that game as if I were the European Union. I'm not. I'm a member of the European Parliament, one of 751, and I happen to disagree with those policies. And you know, I'll just tell you one thing. The number one customers of the weapons industry in France, in Belgium, in the United Kingdom, is which country? Saudi Arabia. With a dictatorship being put in place by Mohammed Ben Salman. I have taken risks in my own country saying that we should have an arms embargo against Saudi Arabia, depriving the main Belgian weapons uh, uh, producer of its main client. We have taken political risks to stand by our values. Yes, we did. But those values weren't much on show in Sharm el-Sheikh, were they? No, they were so not. Perhaps, so perhaps not. instead of concentrating on rules and regulations and protecting the single market, the EU should show a bit more principle. I think that, uh, that indeed we should stand by our principles. And again, our principles should be underpinned by our institutions. But when politicians decide to ignore them, what can I do? The good news is that, well, there's various flavors of uh, political leaders in Europe and not all of them are prepared to do just anything to, uh, to, uh, to just serve their short-term interests. It's more wonder that when the EU is seen, as you said before, as a bureaucratic leviathan and doesn't live up to its human rights principles, the number of people voting in European elections keeps Yours. going down, I doesn't agree. it? And that's a worry. 2014 was the lowest ever, 42.6%. Yeah, Nothing to be proud of, is no. it? No. No, absolutely not. We are fighting and like hell. Your prescription is ever closer union. Absolutely. You want more of the same. No, that's again a misrepresentation. We want more integration, but more, not more of the same, because you can have an integration with different policies. Pouring and more money into endemically corrupt countries in, Balk in the Balkan states? No, we didn't say that. We didn't say that. So, I mean, you can, you can spend your whole time putting words in my mouth that I, that, uh, that I don't agree with. Uh, it won't, uh, but, but it what, won't but, but lead to a very productive conversation. Ever, what does so. it mean, this ever closer union? Ever closer union is basically a statement of fact. United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy, let's take these four countries, are the biggest in Europe. Barely 1% of the population each, of the global population. I mean, those, well, some people, and you may be part of them, maybe not, may think that the United Kingdom once was a global superpower and will be one again. These days are over, over. The only, the, let me finish. The only way for Europeans to carry any weight on the global scale, facing the Putins of this world, facing the Daesh of this world, facing climate change, facing the power uh, of, uh, of big corporates, is to act together. There's no way around this. If you want Acting to with Hungary or Poland with their questionable views on the rule of law, and that's what, what, what closer you union do. with them? Well, there's many Democrats in Hungary. Again, we have a Hungarian government, which is autocratic, which is not respecting the principles of the European Union. And which if wants Hungary, to take the European Hungary, Union in a very different direction exactly. from you. But, I have but confidence, you want closer union but, with them. But I have confidence that the forces of democracy, of real Democrats in Europe, will be stronger than these autocrats. And I hope they will. Because indeed, Given the rise of populism in uh, Europe, doesn't look like it, does it? Well, wait for the results of the 2019 elections and then we'll talk yeah, again. Yeah, I know you did better in, in Bavaria and you've done uh, a little better in... You'll but, see. But they're, but they're very strong and they're very powerful. And we will see whether they keep gaining strength, and I doubt it. We'll see. People in Europe aren't happy with the way that the European Union deals with fraud, for instance. We had a, a new report in January revealed that the EU lost more than 9 billion euros to fraud between 2002 and yep. 2017. Member states doing very little to prevent or punish those who were identified as suspects. Major issue. I agree. I agree. And you mentioned and, Hungary. And how is, how is Closer Union going to do anything about that? Well, it's not... It's not as if closer union is necessary, closer union with that kind of behavior. I mean, the United Kingdom, would you advocate dissolving the United Kingdom because, well, we observe that uh, at the moment we are not fighting fraud enough in if the I United Kingdom? I saw key Kingdom. processes that working. A lot of people are talking about dissolving the United Kingdom. Yeah, well, I'm not one of them. So, 
No, it's not because, uh, well, some processes don't work well in Belgium that we, so, we should dissolve Belgium or France or any country. Mark so Ruta, let's fix them. Mark Rutte, the Dutch them. Prime Minister, yes. says less is more. He doesn't want to see yeah, I mean, more and closer union. You know what? He says do fewer things better. Yeah, yeah, of course. He's been a consultant. Agree? I've been long enough in business to recognize that kind of... Uh, of uh, glossy, uh, uh, glossy guys who, who come with slogans, uh, which mean nothing. Less and is you more. don't? You don't come? You're not a glossy guy so. coming with slogans? No, sorry. Sorry, I've been there. I've been there 22 years in real business. I've seen the, the, the economy from the inside. I've seen, I've seen the, the neoliberal version of globalization from the inside. So you can just say that I'm a glossy politician. Pff, won't impress me much. Won't impress me much, and talk to my well, talk to my voters. Uh, they will they will make their judgment as to how solid I am. We'll see. Philip Lambert, glossy or not, it's good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank, Thank you, you very much. A real pleasure. I just enjoyed every minute of it.